Hello everyone, my name is Gus. Hi, I'm Woody. And today we have a video from one of our favorites, Mr. Ballin. Great. John Allen. He uh, told a story which a lot of people, by the way, asked us to react, react to in the past. It was an incident in Trinidad. You're probably familiar with it. It was last year, I think it was, uh, where a bunch of commercial divers got sucked into a pipe and they were trying to rescue them. And I didn't mm. know a lot of the details, but knowing Mr. Ballin... He's going to get into it, okay. into a lot of the details. So, okay. Let's see what we, what we think. Yes. Mm. At 4 a.m. on February 25th, 2022, a 36-year-old father of three named Christopher Boudram woke up inside of his modest home in Point Up Pierre, which is a city on the Caribbean island of Trinidad and Tobago. After quietly getting out of his bed so as not to wake up his wife, who was still asleep, Christopher walked into the other room and did his typical morning exercise routine, and then afterward, he made himself some breakfast in the kitchen, and by 5.30 a.m., he was out his front door, into his car, making the commute to work. Christopher was a professional scuba diver, and he had been for over 10 years. Commercial diving is a very broad field to work in, but generally it meant that Christopher was paid to do various tasks underwater, things like inspections or welding or just moving equipment around. For the last eight months, Christopher had been fortunate enough to be working for a company that was located just two minutes drive from his house. Awesome. It was an oil and gas company called Perea Fuel. And Christopher's duties at Perea Fuel centered primarily on the upkeep and maintenance of several of these underwater pipelines that Perea Fuel used to get the oil off of their ships and onto land where it could be processed. These underwater pipelines, of which Perea had at least six, were basically U-shaped. They had these two vertical sections on either end that would jut out of the water. And then connecting these two vertical sections was a 1,200 foot long section of pipe that ran along the seabed at roughly 60 feet below the surface. And so one of these vertical sections was out at sea, so 1,200 feet off the coast, and mm -hmm. ships would literally come by this opening to the pipe that was out of the water, and they would dump their oil into this opening. The oil cool. would go down, it would shoot across this long horizontal section, Great and then go up the other vertical section much closer to shore where workers could collect the oil and bring it onto land to be processed. So on this particular day in February of 2022, when Christopher arrived at Perea Fuel, he was not surprised at all to find out that he and his diving colleagues would be doing some maintenance on one of these underwater pipelines. However, there was something unique about the particular pipeline they'd be working on. It was called Birth Number Six, hmm. and unlike the rest of Perea Fuel's underwater oil transport pipelines, this one had not been active since 2018. So for the past four years, it had just sat idle. Now, <laughs> this was on purpose. For whatever reason, the company had decided not to use Birth Number Six, and so they put it into a sort of storage mode, where the vertical section of Birth Number Six that was out at sea was untouched. It was still just poking out of the water, no changes. However, the other vertical section of birth number six that was closest to shore was first plugged up, like imagine putting a cork inside of a wine bottle. That's basically what they did to this vertical section, except they used this huge inflatable cork. Imagine like a huge pool toy. They basically jammed it inside of the vertical section and then they inflated it so much that it was completely airtight inside of this pipe. And then, once it was all plugged up, they submerged this section of the vertical pipe underwater, wow. maybe 5 or 10 feet below the surface, to kind of keep it out of the way of all the ships that would be moving around close to shore. And then, also what they did is they put something called a habitat on top of the opening of this now submerged vertical section of birth number 6. To understand it, you got to picture something else, okay? So imagine you're in the bathtub and you have a bucket and you flip it upside down above the surface so there's nothing inside of the bucket, and you just take the bucket and push it straight down into the water. 
no matter how deep you push that bucket, as long as you don't rotate it to one side or the other and you just keep it steady, that air pocket inside of the bucket will remain. You can literally reach your hand under yeah. the bucket underwater and just it like will be the dry. habitat so we use for deco. That's what this habitat was. Perea Fuel took a huge bucket, if you will, and they lowered it straight into the water and pressed it down and anchored it right above the opening to this submerged vertical section. So there was a permanent air pocket over the opening to this pipe. And the reason for this is because if they needed to do work on this pipe, like for example, today they wanted Christopher and his colleagues to make this pipe active again, which meant doing work on it, the divers could swim down, get inside of this habitat, stand on the little metal platform they put in there, and then they could take nice. off all of their cumbersome diving equipment and just work on the pipe while breathing air. It was really kind of a luxury. And so after Christopher mm -hmm. and the four other divers he'd be with that day got their instructions, you know, to get berth number six active again, they began getting all their gear together and going over who would be responsible for what once they got down to the habitat. And then once they were all ready, they made their way out to the boat. The four other divers that Christopher would be working with that day were men he had worked with many times before and men he would consider his friends. Their names were Kazim Ali Jr., Yusuf Henry, Faisal Kurban, and Rishi Nagasar. Once their boat had moved just off the coast and had stopped kind of roughly over the area where below the surface was this submerged berth number six vertical pipe and the habitat, the divers hopped off the boat and they swam straight down. They went up and under the side of this habitat wall and they entered into this breathable airspace right around the entrance to this pipe. And so they climbed up onto the platform, they took off all of their gear, and then once they were just in their wetsuits, they got to work. Now, the job was relatively straightforward. They just needed to basically pull a lever inside of the pipe that would then deflate the big inflatable plug that had been set inside of this pipe to seal it. However, when one of the divers reached down and began to pull on the lever, it was jammed. And so they needed a wrench to kind of free the lever. And so Kazim volunteered to go back to the surface and get a wrench because no one had one inside of the habitat. And so Kazim put his dive gear back on. He dove out from underneath this habitat, swam back to the surface. He talked to the folks on the boat. They handed him a wrench and then he swam right back down, back inside of the habitat. And then once he poked himself back up, he handed the wrench up to the nearest diver. And that diver took the wrench. He turned back around to face the pipe. He reached down inside and he began fiddling with the lever and eventually he freed it. However, the second this lever was activated, something horrific happened inside of that space. Oh boy. Terrible. Right? We don't know exactly how this happened or what exactly could have been done to prevent it. Mm -hmm. But in short, the second that lever was activated, it began to deflate this big cork that had been plugging up this inactive pipeline for the past four years. And when that happened, it broke the seal and suddenly all this low pressure air that was sitting in 1200 feet of pipeline mm -hmm. made contact with the extremely high pressure air that was inside of this habitat. Oh, no. And air likes to go from high pressure Boom. to low pressure. Yeah, and sucks. so the second that seal was broken, the high pressure air in the habitat expanded down into the pipe. But Dude. this happened so, so quickly. It was almost instantaneous. It was Immediate. almost like the pipe opening yeah. became the world's strongest vacuum. And it sucked everything inside of the habitat, all the air, all the equipment, all five men into the pipe. And it also began but... sucking in seawater. Basically everything was going in this pipe. And so these five men, they don't have their scuba gear on, went from just standing outside the pipe to feet first flying into this pipe with all of their heavy equipment all around them and there's seawater all over them they're holding their breath and so they get sucked down the vertical section they turn the corner and they get rocketed out to sea they are on the 1200 foot long section the horizontal section a just blazing a trail really bad. now think about this all five of these guys have no idea what's happened yeah. they're on a breath hold they are shooting down a pipe they can't see anything the imagine? space inside of this pipe is I mean, so pipe. narrow it's two and a half feet across and so they're getting compressed their shoulders can barely Dude. fit inside of this no, pipe and so you gotta terrible. figure that all of them are expecting to die yeah. but 
eventually the pressure in this pipe equalized. did equalize mm -hmm. yeah. at which point this vacuum phenomenon stopped up at the habitat and actually the habitat kind of refilled with air and when that happened all the seawater that was getting pulled into this pipe also stopped so no more air no more seawater is going into this pipe mm -hmm. it's kind of like whatever went into the pipe that's what's down there and when this equalization happened these men who by this point are on a several minute long breath hold they eventually begin to slow down and come to a stop and by some miracle they came to stop in a section of this horizontal pipe that was not totally flat to the seabed. Wow, it was slightly air. elevated, which meant wow. there was a small air pocket wow. where they stopped. And so they come to a stop and they just start gasping <laughs> for air. And then they begin yelling out to each other and they realize all five of them are alive. And they're all kind of roughly wow. grouped together Stuck in this in air there. pocket. And we know this because one of their cameras on their bodies was rolling when they were pulled into the pipe. And so we can't see anything because it's pitch black inside of, of this pipe. But we can hear them talking to each other once Oof. everything stops. And so over the course of this kind of chaotic initial volley of communication up and down the pipe, where again, these guys are on their backs, you know, mm -hmm. they can't move at all. They're completely kind of trapped in position. Mm -hmm. And even it's though they're in an air pocket, there is water kind of close to their face. And so they have this little area to breathe in. They're panicking, they're screaming at each other. Mm -hmm. But in this volley, they're able to figure out that Christopher was the closest yeah. to the way they had come into the pipe, meaning his head was closest to the vertical section closest to shore, and all four other men were right below him. And so Christopher knew if they were going to get out, their best chance was to backtrack, head towards the way they came in, which True. meant Christopher would have to lead them. And so Christopher kind of found Shawshank it within himself. Style. Again, we can hear him yep. on audio. Yep. And he told the others to calm down and link their feet onto the person below them's shoulders. And Touch so contact. to do that, the only way these guys could move this in really... this tight little pipe is just by pushing with their heels. And so painfully, slowly, these guys who are very badly battered at this point, I mean, they came flying in here, surrounded by all their heavy equipment crashing into them. Guys had broken bones. They were really badly beat up. But they finally make their way until they're all linked, you know, feet under each other's shoulders. And then Christopher, in the lead, began kind of going in reverse, inching their way up the pipe back towards the way they came in. Now, the reason they felt strongly that they needed to act right away and not wait for rescue is because because they didn't really understand how this had even happened. They didn't know if at any moment more water was gonna pour into this pipe. They also understood that there was limited air and at some point they would suffocate. And so with that in mind, they begin this journey. And right away, Christopher reaches the first flooded section of the pipe. Now, you have to understand, they have no idea how long this flooded section black. pipe is. You just and so feel the once water. you start moving into this flooded section behind you, once you go underwater, you're either going to find another air pocket at some point, or you're going to drown. And so it would turn yeah. out that only Christopher and the guy right below him, Faisal, were willing and physically able to attempt this potential suicide mission. And so the others, they began panicking. The others who were not gonna go wow. and they're screaming out for Christopher and Faisal not to leave them. You can oh, hear it on man. audio, but Christopher brutal. and Faisal, they felt strongly yeah. that somebody has to go to the surface and get help. Dude, imagine being in this thing, two and a half feet, right? Like a meter in a little bit like this and panicking. Where do you go? Like, there's nowhere to go. You're like, what? I, <laughs> I mean, I'm, just, I'm not, Yikes. I haven't stopped and reacted because his story is so vivid the way he's telling it. Yes. And I feel like every one of these details are important. I can almost visualize exactly what's going on from the way he's describing you it. You can picture yourself being there. I can picture myself and my face just barely being up there. Gus, Gus. Dude, Mike, what do we do? We move. What do we do? I can't see what happened. Yeah. All right. Somebody would have to think and stay calm. And then we're going to wedge back in. And then we go back. Somebody completely underwater. I'd be like, well, that I'd have to come back out from being back underwater. I'd be like us. When I went a little bit further, I'm underwater. Well, any idea of how far? The vertical pipe is if I go and I swim for it, or you can't swim, wedge. 
You can't swim. You're wedged to it. This is a discussion we would have to have. Just imagine the discussion. You'd be like, well, how long can you hold your breath? Like, yeah. how far can you go? And I'll be like, I'll just try. And we don't know how long it is. Like, I could be telling you goodbye forever. I'll like, try. Like, hey, man. I'll try. I'll, I'll hope when I feel Save it's us. too long, I'll, I'll try to wedge back to you. If I can't make it, I'll... I'll try to come back here. Like, this is the kind of discussion we would have to have. If you make it out, erase my internet browsing history. <laughs> Dude, this is, uh, this is freaking scary. That's not scary. Joke. This, is, this is bad. Okay. And so, Christopher and Faisal, linked together, begin inching into this flooded section of mm -hmm. pipe. Pitch black. They have no idea what's going to happen. They're slowly going under the water, and they just begin inching their way on a breath hold. And by some miracle, this first flooded section they entered into was not very long. And so both Christopher and Faisal were able to barely, you know, coughing and gagging, get out the other side into yet another wow. air pocket. Wow. And by an even bigger miracle, in that new air pocket, Christopher above him, he managed to get one hand above his head, he felt scuba tanks, two of them. And he was able to take one of them and somehow force it past oh. the side of his body down to Faisal. And so both men suddenly had an air tank. Now they had to kind of awkwardly pin the tank above their- Wait, so the scuba tank got sucked in? Everything got so sucked in. I just, oh my goodness, think about that. The scuba tank made it to that spot without getting stuck, wedged, blown Sideways. up, all the air coming out of it. Unbelievable miracle, yeah. like he said. Yeah. Ted, these tanks are not light if you've not scuba dived. It's like pushing a pretty heavy weight. And they had the regulator, so the mouthpiece, that actually gives you the air in their mouths, but they couldn't really hold the mouthpiece in place. It was this very awkward thing they were going to do. No but this meant they could now enter much longer flooded sections of pipe mm. and potentially make it out the other side. And so with their air tanks on top of their heads and their mouthpieces in their mouth, gripping down as hard as they can with their teeth, they can continued to inch along with their heels and they entered into more and more of these flooded sections of pipe. As they're doing this, they know they have a scuba tank, but they have no idea how much air <sighs> is in fun. these tanks. They can't just, see the gauge. Yeah, and so it's fun. kind of the same thing as going in on a breath hold. Right. You don't know when you're going to run out of air because you don't know how long these flooded sections are. And you know you have to keep it cool <laughs> because the more desperate you are, the faster you breathe. So you have to like talk to yourself and be like, stay cool. You're okay. You have air. Keep inching. <sighs> Absolutely. So you can only imagine how terrifying this must have been. But they kept on going and going. And finally, after hours of this, that Christopher and Faisal hours. are going through these terrifying stretches of, you know, hoping they can hold on to that mouthpiece and hoping they got enough air. They get through these flooded sections, hit the next air pocket. You know, after hours of doing that, they reach this air pocket where Faisal starts to kind of lose it. And he starts yelling to Christopher in the total dark to stop, but he didn't have a reason. You know, and Christopher could kind of sense that, you know, Faisal is starting to lose it and we're running out of time here. And Christopher, I mean, he can hear the other divers that they had left behind in the beginning screaming out yeah. all the way back down the pipe. And so Christopher, he stayed composed and he tried to get Faisal to calm down mm -hmm. and come with him. But when it was clear he wasn't going to, he told Faisal that, hey, I'm going to keep going alone then. I'm going to get us help Sorry. and I'll be back for you. And so Faisal, he was still panicking and he yelled at Christopher not to go any further. But Christopher knew he had to go. Yeah. And so with the sound of his friends screaming out for him to stop, Christopher again cinched down with his teeth on the mouthpiece, continued to push this air tank above his head, and he inched his way closer and closer to the entrance of this pipe. And after reaching a very... By the way, that's... That guy had a mask on. These guys, there's no mask. They got nothing. There's no hood on his head. He just got sucked in. We're not even, he had his wetsuit on. They said he, right, they, they kept that on. Sure. Because we're not even talking about temperature or anything else. But however you were in that moment in the pipe, the next moment you're sucked into this. Man. This is really scary freaking scary Very long underwater section where he knows he's running out of air his tank hit the kink in the pipe That's what where I was it saying vertical earlier. again which meant Oof. right above him was the exit the habitat is right up there 
And so Christopher was able to kind of turn and swim up this vertical section until he popped up. And it was again another air pocket, except the water level in this vertical section was not close enough to the exit of the pipe to actually pull himself out. It was like Christopher was stuck at the bottom of a well, like there's nothing he can do. But luckily there was a chain that was dangling oh, down man. in arm's reach. Wow. And so Christopher grabbed the chain and just had to wait, having no idea if anybody was coming to get them. But eventually two rescue divers did get into the habitat and they reached down and they pulled Christopher out of the pipe and they saved him. And when they brought him up to the surface, Christopher saw that Perea Fuel had their emergency response team on site. The Trinidad and Tobago Coast Guard was there. And it's clear they're getting ready to do some sort of rescue operation. And so Christopher, who's totally traumatized, he's badly hurt, he still ran up to authorities and told them, all four of my colleagues are they're still alive. alive. I heard them banging in the pipes. Please. I know they're in air pockets. You got to go back down. You got to save them. But... Ultimately, the authorities decided it was not safe to send rescuers down into this pipe. Who are you going to send into a two and a half foot pipe to rescue people? Mike, Ed, no. I Honestly, I'm wondering what I was just now thinking is, I wonder if there was a way to somehow lift it. No. Send air, send an air tube, like a surface supply type of thing where it would make it all the way to those guys. Like pump the water out or, or something? pump it out oh, with air or something like that. I don't know if that's what happened, Mike. I guess we're going to find out here shortly. Let's see. I, I just am guessing out loud. Yeah, this is a good time to pause the video and think about what could, what would you suggest for this rescue? Like, do you send... Because it's, even if you send a rope, they're stuck like this. It's not like they can, all right, let me hang on to the rope and pull me. Put a winch and pull me like it's but even if you did blow air into it i'm just trying to think about physics here i feel the water would it, would it blow level. Would, would it be able to enough air to blow it out and up that other pipe that's not cap that other one's not capped yeah but, i but, think so but even as you as you blow the air i assume the water is going to be pushed further down and the water level that they're breathing is like you're gonna kill them you would have to suck the water out, like start a pump and like, let's suck the water out. But if you're sucking the water out, is it, isn't it continuing to suck more water in from no, the other it's side of the apparently sticking outside the water, out of the water, like the yeah. pipe, the top. So if you yeah. start sucking the, uh, mm -hmm. the water out, that other one is, is up above the surface. Yeah. Because if they're stuck in a dry pipe, then you have a shot, yeah. I think. But anyway, let's keep watching. Yeah. Good thought. Hit it. And so when oh, Christopher sorry. found out they were not going to try to rescue his friends who are literally banging the pipe, he can hear <laughs> them. He tried to jump back in the water to do it himself. And they stopped it. him. Man. And then Christopher was Great. rushed to the Got hospital it. where once he was admitted to the intensive care unit, he tried to check himself out to go back to the water to save his friends. Wow. But again, Christopher was stopped. For two whole days after Christopher was rescued from this pipe, his colleagues, the four other divers, remained trapped in the most claustrophobic, horrible situation imaginable. CO2. And they continued to bang on the pipe and make noises that could be heard on the surface, but nobody did anything. And so finally, on February 27th, the noises stopped inside of the pipe because all of the men died. They either died of suffocation because they ran out of air in the pipe, or they died from one of their injuries, or they attempted to do one of those long underwater sections of pipe on a breath hold because they didn't have scuba tanks, and they drowned. On February 28th, three of the divers' bodies were recovered, and the final body, the fourth diver, was recovered on March 3rd. It's unclear why Christopher and the other divers did not do something to equalize the pressure inside of the habitat and inside of this pipe mm -hmm. before undoing the plug, because this vacuum effect, which is known as Delta P, mm -hmm. is actually easy to anticipate and relatively easy to prevent. But the investigation into exactly what happened and who is to blame is still ongoing. However, the only survivor, Christopher, and many other people who are following this case, they believe the four deaths are directly attributable to Perea Fuel, who were primarily responsible for not allowing a rescue operation to happen in those first two days where you could clearly hear the sounds of these divers yeah. banging on the pipe. 
And so to finish this story, I'm going to show you the final footage taken by one of the divers, Kazim, who was the one who got the wrench and brought it back inside the habitat, handed it off, and then that wrench was used to push the lever, which created the vacuum. You'll see in this video that it looks like nothing is going on, and Kazim is just inside of this habitat, and all the divers are fine, and then it's like his camera just turns black. What's happening there is he was pulled so quickly into the pipe that it looks like it was a cut of the camera, wow. when in reality, that's just how fast everything inside of that habitat was pulled into the pipe. Wow. This video is highly distressing. Viewer discretion is advised. Dude, look at this habitat. I wish we had deco habitats like that. Look, they're completely out of the water. Dude, here's the. This wrench. is how dangerous this commercial diving is. You yeah. know, a lot of accidents happen. Here's the real deal. He's just messing with the wrench or doing stuff. No idea what's about to happen. Boom. Sucked. Immediate. From one second you're standing there to the next second you're sucked through a pipe. I mean, it could rip you, cut you as you were being sucked through, right? Listen. Man, that is... Wow. I don't even know what to say about this one. That that was vivid. That was vivid, Mr. Ballen. You described it perfectly. Yeah. It's just really tough because, you know, as as an engineer, you you would like to think that oh, there's got to be a way, you know, to to, to save to, to get them out, and that's why you know the statement about, well, you know. Pariah fuel or whatever their name is, they 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 should be liable because they didn't allow a rescue. What rescue? How are you gonna rescue them? Jump back in the pipe with like new tanks or something? You know, uh, these are this is the situation when we do reactions, right? We're sitting yeah. here in a chair, and it's very easy to, you know, be the uh, what do they call it? The uh, armchair quarterback. armchair quarterback. Yeah. I can't be an armchair quarterback on this one. This is no, this is, this is a horrific. massive devastation, and I don't know. Maybe there was, you know, we're some pretty smart people were there, and they couldn't oh, figure it out, right? I mean, yeah. they had limited time. You know that the oxygen is going to go away. They're breathing. The thing is filling up with CO2. Can you imagine how they started feeling confused, breathing more and more CO2, and they're and wedged tight. and cold, I don't know, cold, miserable black no light and then you how about you stop hearing one voice maybe i'm gonna last longer than you gus gus and you've been talking to me for two days and no more so now i know you're gone right next to me and i'm still barely hanging on imagine oh, what would man. be going through the guy's head that's still with his buddy their friends i'm just think about all of the how really terrible. bad this is terrible so yeah, yeah. It's just really, really tough. And um, we have obviously covered other stories from Mr. Ballin, like the story of the guy who allegedly stabbed himself in the heart to prevent drowning, which still doesn't make sense to this day. You got but a lot of comments on that one. I don't even want to fire up all your comments. Apparently again. did not get enough. As all I said was, I, I don't know if you remember mm. on that one. Maybe he may have. But yeah, let's not rehash that. Well, no, we're about to because I'm going to leave it right here. Oh, here comes a couple thousand comments. Good. Let's bring it. It still <laughs> doesn't make sense. Bye, everybody. This was a tough one. It really was.